This season's college football national championship epitomizes a tale as old as time. The overmatched underdog opposite the ferocious giant, David versus Goliath. No one expected TCU to be here. With preseason title odds north of 200 to 1, the Horn Frogs would be the unlikeliest of champions in modern college football. But even though they made it here, not many outside their own locker room think they can actually get it done. Let's go get one more. TCU opened as a 13-point underdog against Georgia, the largest point spread in any BCS or college football national title since 2002, when Miami was favored by 12 against Ohio State. And the Buckeyes won, perhaps a good omen for the Horned Frogs. But in terms of talent, the matchup is lopsided. Georgia boasts the second most talented roster in the country, while TCU doesn't even crack the top 30, ranking 32nd overall. But the games aren't played on paper, and if anyone knows that by now, it's the folks from Fort Worth. We're going to do exactly what we've done every game up to this point. We're going to prepare the best we can. We're going to play really hard. Our guys are going to play tough. On the other side, the Georgia Bulldogs, the defending national champions. The Dogs seeking a dynasty, looking to become the first program to win back-to-back -back titles since Alabama did it a decade ago. The defensive coordinator for those Crimson Tide teams, Kirby Smart, who's brought that same winning culture with him to Athens. Take the snap, take a knee, win the game! Since Smart took over in 2016, the Bulldogs have had four 12-plus win seasons. They've had 50 players drafted, and this will be Smart's third national championship game. If we want any chance of winning a national championship, we have to play a lot better football, but we got to keep the resiliency and composure along with us. It's been the best college football playoff to date, and we've got one more game to go. Who will stand victorious when the fight is over? David or Goliath? Welcome everyone into our 24-7 sports studios. I'm Grace Remington, joined by our national college football analyst, Brandon Marcello, to preview this national championship game. Early lines has Georgia as a 13 to 14 point favorite. So it seems like, yet again, no one giving TCU a chance. And that's fine for them. They love the underdog mentality. And time and time again this season, they've proved everyone wrong. So Brandon, what does TCU need to do to pull off another monster upset? TCU just needs to play its game. They went into Michigan as a seven and a half point underdog. They got up early, which they're not accustomed to doing. But then that got Michigan to start playing the way TCU does, which is worth up tempo. And TCU is fine with that. They kept playing their game offensively. They kept punching and counter punching. And so if they can get Georgia to do the same thing, which by the way, they probably will because Georgia likes to play some up tempo offense. TCU's got a shot in this, and everybody talks about the intangibles and all this, but listen, TCU is just a legit great team with an elite offense. You're seeing the numbers right now. They score more than 40 points per game, no matter the opponent. Michigan's defense was stellar entering this game, and TCU made them look less than pedestrian. I think Georgia, which just gave up 40 plus points to a Big Ten Ohio State team, is going to be in a world of trouble if they allow TCU quarterback Max Duggan to sit back there and make the type of throws that we saw in the Fiesta Bowl. All right, looking at the matchups here, TCU looks equipped to follow Ohio State's blueprint and attack this Georgia team through the air. Max Duggan and Quinton Johnson, we know the great connection they've had all season long, but TCU's backfield a little banged up after that Fiesta Bowl, and we know Georgia has the best run defense in the country. So what kind of game plan should we expect to see from the Horn Frogs? Yeah, be respectable at least for the run game. And to do that, I think TCU needs to rotate their running backs a little bit to keep them fresh back there. Kendra Miller told me after the game that he twisted his knee. He believes he'll be good to go for the national championship game, but he slowed down a little bit. Now, you go back to Amari DeMarcado, who had yet to even have a 100-yard game his entire season. In fact, his four-year career only had one in his career at TCU and then bust for 150 yards against Michigan. I think they're fine there. TCU does not need to go in this game thinking they need to rush for 150 yards to win. Ohio State did just enough to keep it respectable and make Georgia have to play their run. 
He only rushed for about 150 yards themselves, maybe a little bit under that at times. So just keep the run game as a threat, as a potential threat, and throw the ball as often as you want, but make sure that when you run the ball, you can hit some explosives. TCU did a fantastic job setting up the run in the Fiesta Bowl, and Amari DiMarcato averaged more than eight yards per carry, and in doing so, helped TCU ice that game away. I think they got a really good shot here if they could figure out a way to neutralize or at least neutralize him about maybe one every, out of every four plays. Jalen Carter, that massive defensive tackle for Georgia, who I call the event horizon for them because everything that goes near it just gets swallowed up. Yeah, scary guy. All right, on the other side of the ball, Georgia continuing to roll offensively with one of its best seasons it's ever had under Kirby Smart. TCU's defense still gave up 45 points to Michigan, but how should Georgia attack this Horn Frogs defense, and what can TCU do to slow down the Bulldog offense? I think Georgia should try to run the ball and run it often and early against TCU, and if they do that successfully, obviously it's going to open things up in the pass game, but I think it's going to wear down TCU quickly. If you look at the Fiesta Bowl, TCU was worn down midway through the third quarter against Michigan, and that helped Michigan get back in that game and that great scoring output, but they kind of got away from that. They felt like they had to throw the ball a little bit more, and that fed into TCU's game plan with that 3-3-5 scheme. They were closing windows quickly with those safeties. Georgia needs to go after that three-man front of TCU and wear them down quickly. Georgia has by far the best talent TCU's going to face all season, maybe over the next three to four years, to be quite honest, with what I think is one of those generational type teams and generational type offenses for Georgia. All right, we hit the upset potential, the matchups. Give us one storyline we need to be following heading into this game. I think it's going to be Quentin Johnston, the receiver for TCU, and if he can have that game-breaker mentality against this Georgia defense. Much like Marvin Harrison Jr. for Ohio State against Georgia, he is going to be the difference. And if he is turned down and not able to get things cranked up, that is going to be a big, big issue for TCU. Quentin Johnston in the Fiesta Bowl, three of his first six targets were incomplete passes. Michigan was doing a great job using bracket coverage to kind of keep him at bay, but you were just waiting for him to break through. And certainly enough, he did that with a 70-plus yard touchdown grab on what was going to be a screenplay, but he showed his incredible speed to get it done. Georgia, you got to slow him down, keep everything in front of you. If you keep Quentin Johnson in front of you, Georgia wins this game. Yeah, Quentin Johnson, a yak monster. All right, let's look at the lines on this game. Georgia favored by 13 and a half at most books with the points total set at 62 and a half. So, Brandon, if you had to put a wager somewhere, where are you looking? I would say TCU covers. Georgia's going to win. TCU covers that line. TCU 10-3 and 1 this year against the spread. TCU just is not going to get blown out in a game like this. I just don't see it. Not with that offense, not with Max Duggan being a gamer. In fact, I think TCU is going to be in this game in the second half, and it's going to be very entertaining. As for that total, I think it's under. I think it's going to be a game that's more like 31 to 28, maybe 31 to 24 as a final, and that'll keep it under that point total. But this will be a competitive game. It's going to be coming down, I think, to schematic changes in game coaching for TCU to be able to kind of stay with Georgia because Georgia's going to be comfortable to play this game any way it wants, and TCU's going to want to push the tempo a little bit. That's okay with Georgia, but can TCU in-game find those type of personnel matchups and be able to make the type of play calls and adjustments from the coaching booth? That's going to be critical. TCU, one of the best teams in the nation against the spread, so I like that cover. Let's go with the trends. All right, thanks, Brandon, for your time. Now for more coverage leading up to the national championship, let's go to our team site experts. Thank you, Grace. Well, it is our last college football game of the season, so everyone is talking about it, but very few people have been there every step of the way with boots on the ground. Now these two guys have. Let's welcome in our friends Rusty Manzel of Dogs 247 and Jeremy Clark of Horned Frogs Blitz. Guys, 
If we wanted to put these two teams in a box and slap a label on them, look no further than their prospective preseason odds to win this game. Georgia was 4-1, to one, pretty good. TCU, 200-1. to one. Both of these squads had played their respective parts of Hunter and Hunted very well. So how does each team's personality and mentality impact this game? Jeremy, let's start with you. I mean, TCU's made it to the national championship for the first time in 84 years. I think they already feel like um, they've, they've accomplished something. They were picked to finish seventh in the Big 12. Obviously, no one expected them to be here. I don't think anyone expected a 13-1 and record. Obviously, not playing in the national championship. But if you look at that mentality, they've been underdogs all year long. People discounted them, left them out. And uh, they just keep surprising people every week. And I think last week against Michigan, we saw that once again. Not a lot of people gave them a chance to be playing against Georgia in the national championship. But here they are. And uh, they're going to continue to try to keep surprising some people. You look at Georgia, I think it started at the SEC media days. Kirby's first message when he spoke to the media back in July said, at the University of Georgia, we will not be hunted. We will be the hunter. I think the mentality there was we won the national championship. We know we're going to get everybody's best shot coming back this season, but we're just as hungry as a football team. The culture, the program here, the ability to motivate and build this culture, what Kirby Smart has done, Losing 17 NFL draft picks or 16 NFL draft picks was absolutely crazy to imagine this team is back in the national championship and a chance to potentially finish off an undefeated season. Uh, this wasn't built overnight. Kirby Smart in the years that he's been there has stacked this roster up. They've won big games, but coming in this mentality, it started in July for me. And the very first message was Kirby Smart was at University of Georgia, we will not be hunted. I love that. Meanwhile, those are how these two teams differ, but here's how they're the same. Both of them have an incredible underdog story playing quarterback. Where have you seen both Stetson Bennett and Matt, Max Duggan use that as a chip for inspiration? Rusty, kick us off with the mailman. It started in January of 2016. I got a chance to work out Stetson, ben Stetson Bennett in Valdosta, Georgia in high school, and I looked back at my notes, and the first thing I think, the first thing I said was he has a very live arm, but he's small. So I was one of the first people to write him off. Now, every every uh, fall, he's been written off. In fact, two years ago, Georgia basically told him, look, you're third string, you're not going to play. Whatever you've been told, Stetson Bennett has been the opposite. He's won games. He's now 28-3 and three as a starter. You know, he's a lifelong Georgia Bulldog fan. He's been going to these games as a kid with his family. Everything he's done, it's going to be a movie. And regardless of what happens next Monday night, it's going to have a great story. But can he have the ultimate story? Can he be the first Georgia Bulldog quarterback to lead them in their long history to be back-to-back -back national champions? For whatever reason, I've said this about Stetson Bennett all year, the bigger the game, the better he plays. And he was 12 for 14 in the fourth quarter against Ohio State for 200 yards. And those, that last drive going for out five for five, he threw two of the best balls I've ever seen him throw. He's been pretty clutch. I love Stetson Bennett's game. And, and Max obviously doesn't have the cool backstory of being a, a walk-on and going to Juco and then coming back and, and, and competing for that spot. But what I love about Max Duggan this year is he's overcome some adversity in his own right. Being named the backup after starting 29 games in his career, he's named the backup to start the season. Obviously, Chandler Morris goes down against Colorado. Max comes in. Starts to play really well, then he keeps playing well. Um, the one thing Sonny Dykes said this week about these two guys, and, and, and it really stands true, both these guys have a similar playing style. They throw the ball all over the field. They make great plays with their feet, but they compete. They're 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 competitive. Competitive. Uh, can't say that word for some reason, but they they go out there and compete as as well as they can. They want to win the ball game for for their teams, and I don't think you have a when you have guys like that that have that winning drive in both of them, man, it's going to be fun to watch these two guys compete, try to lead their team to a big victory on Monday. Yeah, you mentioned it, two great arms, but you also see that scrappy nature in Duggan's play. He's scrambling for extra yards. It's a huge part of his game. So, Jeremy, how is his ability to extend plays and kind of get loose really open up this offense? I think it's been really big for him. Uh, he's always been known as a runner. If you look at the highlights over the last three years, 
most of them are coming from him running the football. I mean, he's he's a tremendous runner when it comes uh, in, in empty sets. I think teams got to be uh, weary of him taking off and running the football. Uh, he's he's made big plays with his feet over the years, but what I really like about him this year is he's got an ability to throw the football, and I think that's what's opened up the run game for him a little bit more. Obviously, we, we're going to see those uh, power drives with him. He's going to run the zone reads, RPOs. But I think they're going to give him a chance to get back and throw, kind of open up the, the passing game a little bit. He's done really well completing those deep vertical passes this year. And if you watch it against Michigan, he's done a great job of uh, extending plays with his feet, uh, made great uh, gro- great throws to uh, Tay Barber and Quentin Johnston for some big plays and two touchdowns. So I think he's going to be dangerous with his arm and with his feet against Georgia. I mean, Rusty, conversely, Georgia struggled a bit to contain C.J. Stroud in that semi. So how did the dogs address that aspect of Duggan's game? Well, the biggest thing in that game about C.J. Stroud was the surprise that he did run as much. And I think he created a tremendous value for him because he hadn't shown that all year. Max Duggan has shown he's going to run, and that's part of his game. Georgia has got to get him to the ground. I've watched three TCU games last night kind of skipping through them. The one thing I think about him is he breaks a lot of tackles to extend plays. Uh, He also can throw. This is not just a runner. You know, he, he does throw the deep ball. He does spread it around, but he will get behind his pads. They have designed plays for him. This is the national championship. They're going to leave nothing in the bag. They're going to run every single play they can and use him as much as possible. I think for Georgia, Jamon Dumas Johnson and Smile Monday, those two inside linebackers, they're both super fast, big-time prospects. Here's what they got to do when they get to him. They've got to get him to the ground. He, they cannot let him turn second and seven into third and one. It needs to be third and six, third and five. But I look forward to this matchup. I, his The ability and what he does, uh, watch some of the Big 12 uh, championship game, and what he did in that game, even the loss, was unbelievable. Uh, the grittiness, the effort you can see in him when they show him on the sidelines. This kid's a winner. Yeah, you had to drag him off the field in the Big 12 championship game. He was not going down without a fight. Another major theme of the semis, though, is the impact of turnovers. And, Jeremy, we know that the Frogs secondary loves to be opportunistic, as we saw. So what makes that unit and just the defense as a whole so strong at creating those big plays and turnovers? Well, I think with that 3-3-5, you're setting up your defense to get more takeaways. I think – uh, the safeties have improved this year under Joe Gillespie. The, obviously, Bud Clark made a great play against Michigan, uh, returned that pick six. But Mark Perry coming over from Colorado, he's given a big boost to the secondary. Uh, Miller Bradford's also played well. But when you have two corners like Trey Hodges Tomlinson and Josh Newton, you're, you're going to be really good in the secondary when it comes to defending the pass. But what I really feel like has helped this defense is you know strong play from the linebackers, D winners, Jamoy Hodge, Johnny Hodges, the Big 12 Defensive Newcomer of the Year. He's played great, but Dylan Horton. Dylan Horton was humongous in that game against Michigan. Had a career-high 10 sacks. And typically, you don't see a defensive lineman in a 3-3-5 have a, have a role like that in a game. You don't see him come, uh, come away with four sacks. And uh, Dylan Horton did a tremendous job against J.J. McCarthy, getting to him, forcing some early throws, and, and had a strip sack. And he just came up big tremendously and uh, – 13 tackles for a loss for that defense as well. So the team speed in that 3-3-5 is what really has set TCU apart, and that's one of the things that I felt like they had an advantage over Michigan in. I don't feel like Michigan really saw what was coming, not only with a 3-3-5, but with the overall team speed that TCU has running that defense. Okay, so maybe Michigan did not see it coming, but Rusty, you know that Kirby Smart is well aware of what TCU can do in creating havoc. So how does Georgia prepare for that, and how do they limit those opportunities? Georgia is built more for the the negative plays. They want to get the sacks. They want to get the tackles for loss. I mean, they do try to create as much turnover as they can. They gave up 41 points, and they sacked C.J. Stroud four times. I go back and watch the Tennessee game sometimes, and what they did to Hendon Hooker, they got to him. I mean, Tennessee was this fast-paced, spread-you-out offense, and they never let him get going. Uh, Tremendous pressure on him. Those type of things. Got a couple turnovers late because of that, so – you know, I don't know that Georgia is built. They want to do turnovers. They want to create turnovers. But I know this. They're going to pressure. They're going to bring it. They had two big-time pressures on that last drive. They made Ohio State attempt a 50-yarder instead of a 38-yarder. And had C.J. Stroud not escaped a pressure and throw it out of bounds, the game would have been over on third down, regardless, the play before. So I think when you look at that, you look at the speed. Here's, here's a, a fact now. 
Georgia lost Nolan Smith about three games ago, four games ago. That's been a huge loss. Uh, Chaz Chambliss replaced him. He got hurt against Ohio State. Nobody's going to say poor pedal for me when you say, okay, we're going to insert Michael Williams. He's a five-star. We're going to insert Marvin Jones Jr. He's a five-star. But the fact the re- fact remains, they played very little. So you're going to throw two true freshmen out on the edge and hope that you can create pressure. You hope you can set the edge and maintain a fast-paced TCU offense on Monday night. So we're going to find out this time for those kids to grow up really fast. Michael Williams played really good against Ohio State going against a top-10 pick in Paris Johnson. He lost some battles, but he certainly had some eye-opening plays, particularly one sack where he he pretty much jacked Paris Johnson up. So you look at these two freshmen, it's time to go for those guys. Whew, I am so excited for this game. Thank you both for getting me even more ready. Be sure to check out Dogs 24-7 and Horned Frogs Blitz for unrivaled coverage of this game and for all things dogs and frogs all year long. And thank you for watching. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to the 24-7 Sports YouTube page. Enjoy the game.